It's go time for the DNC. What will it mean getting around Chicago? Tens of thousands of protesters are expected in the city. We're doing this as a intellectual speech. You're all intellectuals today. And today we take the next step. Thank you, Joe. And what about the message from the candidates? What are Trump and Harris saying on the campaign trail? This is The Brief. I'm Marianne Ahern. After more than a year of planning, 50,000 visitors are coming. And when we say visitors, it's the delegates, it's the media, and it's the protesters. They're all gonna be converging in Chicago this week. It is a chance to showcase the city, but it will mean routines are disrupted. And that's our first takeaway of three from this past week. It's beginning to look a lot like a political convention everywhere you go. New flags are flying over the Michigan Avenue Bridge. Hotel entrances are decorated. Fences in place. Streets are closed as Chicago prepares for the 2024 DNC. We have plans in place to handle the additional crowds and increase traffic citywide. The largest impacts will be felt around the United Center and McCormick Place. One impact the near west side is already feeling. You can't park anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> the no parking restrictions outside the security perimeter, even blindsiding Alderman Walter Burnett. Then all of a sudden, bam, out of nowhere we get signs that say we can't park for 10 days. The concerns especially high for residents at these senior apartments near Polina and Washington. People can't walk, we have disabled people, we have people that we have not nurses, doctors, therapists, and all types of counselors here that come every day. The Secret Service says allow extra travel time and take public transportation when you can because there will be traffic headaches due to street closures and motorcades for high profile speakers at the convention. Some offices downtown even telling employees to stay home during the DNC. With all the activity in the area, they decided it would be best for everyone to just uh, designate themselves as work from home for the week. Another reason for that? Protests. And that's takeaway number two for the week. We finally know their march route after lengthy, long legal battles with the city of Chicago. Starting at Union Park, tens of thousands of pro-Palestinian protesters will walk a little more than a mile, first down Washington, then forming a loop that eventually leads them down Lake Street. It's nearly half the size of the route the coalition wanted. We made a compelling argument, we believe, for why we needed a longer route. They're not the only group fighting with the city to get their message heard during the DNC. I requested two permits, both of them outside of the perimeter on Madison Avenue. They denied both of them. Chicago Union firefighters and paramedics say they've been working without a contract for three years, and it's leading to decreased response times, a message they'd like thousands of delegates and media to hear. Now I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to have my own little demonstration. We're not allowed to strike, so we're going to have a demonstration every day just to let everyone know what our situation is. There will be a speaker's platform and sound system set up at Park 578, close to the United Center. Chicago's top cop offering reassurance, saying he's aware there will be protests, but officers have received the training they need to handle whatever comes their way. People in the city of Chicago shouldn't be afraid. You should not be afraid to go about your day and, and do what you normally do. Our final takeaway, what are the candidates saying this week on the presidential campaign trail? She cast a tie-breaking votes that caused record inflation. She cast the votes. She's trying to blame Biden, as you know. So it was Biden, but I'm going to do a better job. Former President Donald Trump talking inflation during a news conference at his New Jersey golf club. Kamala Harris, meanwhile, made a joint appearance with President Biden in Maryland to discuss lowering drug costs. And so in the United States of America, no senior should have to choose between either filling their prescription or paying their rent. It was their first time together on the campaign trail since announcing that Biden would not seek re-election. Folks, I have an incredible partner. The progress we've made, she's going to make one hell of a president. Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, accused Harris of hiding from the press, noting that she has yet to conduct a lengthy interview since becoming the nominee. 
You have got to stand before the American people and answer tough questions if you want to do this job. With polls showing Harris improving in swing states, Republicans question the Democrats' decision to replace Biden with Harris without any voters casting primary ballots. He got 14 million votes. He got no votes. And you look at what happens. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. Uh, they are a threat to democracy, right, as they say. Also this week, Harris's choice to be her running mate, Tim Walz, had his first solo appearances since being selected to be the Democratic vice presidential nominee. People in this room built the middle class. And it's not just a saying, it's a fact. When unions are strong, America's strong. Now that you're caught up, let's look ahead. And what can we expect over the next week, especially in terms of security? Joining us now, someone familiar to Chicagoans, of course, is the former police superintendent, Gary McCarthy, current police chief of Willow Springs. Is the city ready from what you see for this big event? You know, I'm not positive. Um, I know that we did a lot of work for about eight months before the NATO summit, and we weren't facing the same things. Um, there's a threat of international terrorism that for, for a time kind of waned. Um, but there's also the Israel-Palestinian thing that's going on. And uh, they're also down, I think, about 3,000 officers, something like that. I, I, those are the numbers I've heard. I don't, I don't have any inside information So is your that. gut telling you, would you tell your loved ones, stay away from Chicago? Well, I, I think it's just practical, and not because it's dangerous. It's just going to be annoying, if nothing else, to not be able to drive places because there's going to be big crowds. You know there's going to be protests. They're going to shut down streets here and there. And even if it's just like NATO, where they walked around and we walked with them a lot, um, that's going to affect traffic and, and just the ambiance of Chicago. What about the training since NATO? Is there a difference in what you tell police officers in interacting with those protesters? I don't think that the training is different, but it's a perishable skill. I mean, we did it 12 years ago. And if there wasn't some sort of a serious refresher, and God knows how many of those officers from NATO are still here, right? If there, if there wasn't some serious refresher training and training up to the level that we had, we had a plan, we had communications, we had leadership, we equipped, and we executed. And, you know, that's why it went as well as it did. Okay, we saw with the Trump attempted assassination that there was a miscommunication, or maybe it's a not communication, what's the right word, between the feds and the local police. How do we make sure that doesn't happen? Well, first of all, it's incomprehensible to me. There, there has to be, when you're having a multi multi-agency event like Secret Service, FBI, and local policing, there has to be a command post with somebody sitting there from each one of those agencies. Could be that simple. You could be sitting in a trailer with a cell phone and a radio. <laughs> so if we get information, we give it to them. They put it out to their people. If they get information, they put it out to us. Uh, it's incomprehensible that that happened. And, I mean, you witnessed that at 9-11 in New York. Tell us what you saw that. Here you were right there. You would think, what, some 24 years later, we have not learned how the feds and the locals communicate yet? Well, you know, I hate to say this, but I, I want to go back to the Boston bombing because I was the superintendent here when it happened. And my FBI counterpart here was outstanding. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there was no information coming in. I leave his office Wednesday afternoon. I come back to my office. I turn on the TV, and on CNN, they're showing the Sarnev brothers. <laughs> the FBI didn't tell Chicago FBI about that. So, you know, there's some cultural issues where people hold on to information. I thought we got over it, like you said, after 9-11. After 9-11, we were like, why didn't you tell us about this? They're like, well, you didn't have the clearances. So we all got the clearances. Guess what? Still, we don't hear. All right, so what will you tell? You, you said you hope they're ready. You're cautiously optimistic, but your final thought to viewers who are watching, to, what would you tell them for next week? Um, rest up, <laughs> of course, you're gonna, you're gonna be on your feet a lot. Uh, take care of each other, execute the plans that you've made, and I hope that the leadership provides leadership. That made an enormous difference during NATO. The entire executive staff was out there. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of the way we executed our plans back then. Well, we appreciate your expertise in telling us how to look out for what's ahead. Thanks so much, Gary McCarthy. My pleasure, Marianne. Thank you. When we come back, we'll take a deep dive into Chicago's rich political convention history 
And we'll also hear from someone who's seen a lot of conventions, Bill Daly. There aren't many events that focus the nation, and to some degree the world, on one city or one region. Political conventions, for those who've not been to one or seen one, what are they about? Well, they are supposed to energize and also unite the parties to celebrate the nominees for president. They used to be the opportunity to actually pick the nominee, and that meant they were often contentious. Chicago has seen 25, soon to be 26 conventions. Surprisingly, more Republican than Democratic ones. And for more on the rich history, we visited the Chicago History Museum. You can't miss them. These red stars and stripes symbolizing the Chicago flag built to highlight the path downtown. Just one of the many footprints left from a past political convention. If you're stuck in Hubbard's cave and you look up and you see those stars, thank the second Mayor Daley and the 96 uh, DNC. 1996, the last time Democrats gathered in the Windy City to nominate their presidential candidate. But Chicago has actually hosted 11 Democratic and 14 Republican conventions, plus third parties, more than any other city. The main reason, especially through the mid 20th century, is that Chicago historically has been an easy place to get to. Historically, by train, but more recently, with the two airports, according to Peter Alter, chief historian at the Chicago History Museum, he also points to the city's great venues. We've had the Chicago uh, Stadium uh, before the United Center. We've ha we had the International Amphitheater, uh, Chicago Coliseum, uh, and going way back to Abraham Lincoln, also the Wigwam. Yes, in the land of Lincoln, the first convention was back in 1860 when Republicans nominated Abraham Lincoln. The party was in its infancy. We actually have a Bible in our collections that we believe he swore to God on and sort of accepted uh, what we would call the RNC's nomination. Alter's favorite fast fact comes from an earlier convention, 1932, with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, pictured here with Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak. Some historians believe that he first uttered the, the words, the New Deal here. But the most talked about DNC was 1968. Bert Odelson was there working as a page. To see National Guard troops with fixed bayonets on Michigan Avenue in the midst of the demonstrations, uh, something a 20-year-old kid in college uh, was not used to. Police clashed with demonstrators who chanted, the whole world is watching. Also chaos inside with delegates fighting on the floor. I didn't see punching, but I saw pushing and a lot of uh, disruption when the nomination was being uh, entered into the record and each state was starting to name uh, who they wanted for president. It is the paramount necessity for unity. Parallels from unity 1968 have been drawn country. to this year because the incumbent president decided not to run. The vice president ultimately became the nominee and there was political violence with the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. At the time, the country was harshly divided over the Vietnam War. We think sometimes of history as remote, but um, a lot of the pitched battles between demonstrators and um, the police happened like right outside our doors. All of it influencing Odelson's choice to become an election and municipal attorney. In my mind, I wanted to go to law school so that I could uh, graduate and then make a difference. So that things that I saw, uh, maybe I could help to make sure it didn't happen again. Because it wasn't good for Chicago, it wasn't good for politics, it just wasn't good at all. I want to build a bridge to the 21st century. Neither party would return to Chicago for 28 years. That was Bill Clinton's second nomination. When Democrats danced to the Macarena. We met in Chicago. And Mayor Richard M. Daley focused on beautifying Chicago. What it really did is it uh, kind of rejuvenated the city maybe a little bit um, in the eyes of the Democratic Party. And now another 28 years later, with those remnants from the past, Chicago once again looks to put its best foot forward. And yes, the whole world 
is watching. So joining us now, Bill Daly. A lot of you recognize him, former Commerce Secretary, former Chief of Staff, lots of different titles. Let's start with a lot has changed in the last six weeks. Yeah, and sure is. you've been through several conventions. How do you manage an event like this? And why are you back helping out on doing it? Well, I'm, I'm back. I, I love Chicago, obviously. We live here. And it's a great th time for the city to show itself. Obviously, I've been to numerous conventions since 1960. was the first one we went to with my dad. So there's, a, there's an excitement around. You see old friends. So I really don't have an official role, but I'm, I'm trying to be helpful and then uh, seeing a lot of friends. They're good for the city, and it's good for the party to get together, the activists, the people who engage in, in politics year-round, to get together every four years and sort of celebrate what's going on. How's the mood shifted in that six-week time? Well, I think it's shifted enormously. You can just feel it, not just amongst the Democrats, but amongst the general public. You now have an exciting election going to take place. I think there was a sense before the president uh, made his announcement that you were everyone was kind of just going to the motions, and you and they were very nervous because it looked like we were really in a difficult situation. Right now, the, the, the thing has kind of turned to where the vice president is very competitive, if not ahead now in states that the president was behind for many, many months. So it's, it's brought an energy and an enthusiasm to the election that really wasn't there. But the Dems, they are a big tent. Are you nervous at all about protesters, especially those who are the cause of Gaza that have been really vocal and saying, hey, we're going to march no matter what, no matter where they tell us to go? Yeah. Well, that, that's an issue where they go and how they march. As the superintendent said the other day, they're going to be very cooperative, the police department. We have the greatest police department in the country. I think they have proven that time and time again. But I think he, the, the superintendent was very direct in saying we will be cooperative for those who are peaceful. Those who are not, uh, we will take action against them. They're not going to allow troubled makers to take over demonstrations. So, but I think overall, uh, I think there's a, there's a mood in the country. Yes, the Gaza situation is serious, and a lot of people feel strongly about it. But, um, but it, is, it is still a relatively small, small number of people, even if there's 10,000, 20,000 people, in comparison to previous uh, conventions, obviously the one in 68, you had many, many thousands more people that... When you said you went to them as sort of a family event, I mean, it's it sounds, it's almost like your Super Bowl, you know? <laughs> it's like, it is. It's Super Bowl of politics every four years. It is. It's where all of the people come together who are active year-round within the party and elected officials get together, celebrate, sometimes fight. But uh, this one will be a celebration uh, more than, uh, than anything. And a challenge to Democrats and independents to look at this election differently than maybe they looked at it uh, six weeks ago. And, and what about that? You have to take that unity. Obviously, the Republicans had unity in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. switched up after they left. Who knows what might happen after this is over and there's debates ahead. Sure. How do you capture that atmosphere, that festivity, and take it all the way to November 5th? Well, that's through a good organization. And I think the vice president has a very good campaign organization, experienced people. Many of them been around for a while, whether it's through the Biden or Obama administrations and some even back to Clinton years. So she's got a very serious um, experienced team and they get the yin and yang of those 90 some days after the convention um, where the benefit for, for her is it's a short period. The problem is if there's a problem in a short campaign, it's hard to re, uh, correct it. Well, and if there is a problem, I got a feeling they might call Bill Daly. So no, thank you. I, don't know about that. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> they might. They might. We appreciate all your right, take on all of this. Thank yep. you so much. All right. Have a good Great day. Great to see you. Thank you. When we come back, we'll hear from Cook County Commissioner Donna Miller. She not only shares the same university, but also the same sorority as the presidential Democratic nominee, Kamala Harris. Joining us now, Cook County Commissioner Donna Miller, who has an interesting tie to Kamala Harris, a couple of ties. Uh, both Howard grads, both members of the same sorority, the AKAs. You lived in California when she was in politics there. So give us your short, your elevator speech on Harris and why you are so energized by her choice, by having her as the choice. Well, clearly, thanks for being, for having me here today. I mean, 
her uh, being soared into this position was perfect. Actually, in 2020, I was a Kamala delegate as well. So then when she became the vice presidential nominee, it was very exciting. But to see her move up the ranks through all the different political positions that she's had, elected political positions, which is important to state, um, is just thrilling, exciting, and to see her trajectory make this move to be the candidate for President of the United States. It's exciting not only for women, not only for black women, but it's exciting for our whole country because of everything that she represents. Six weeks ago, this would not have been in the cards. And yet, there, and there was a lot of questions. The Democrats were not at all thinking that this is the way it was going to maybe go. We thought there might even be a contentious convention. Are you glad that's not the case? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. So I was actually part of the 2016, I was on the Rules Committee at the DNC, where it was a little contentious then, so at least we don't have to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the Democrats, they're a big tent, and they like to bring everybody in. And so... Some had wanted, I mean, even Governor Pritzker would, did not endorse her day one when uh, President Biden stepped away. He didn't wait a day. But what do you expect to see at the convention? The convention, not only is it going to be exciting, I think we're going to see just different p parts of the country unified, rallying behind Kamala Harris and Walls as the ticket. But also, it's exciting for the down ticket races as well, because people are going to come out and vote. People are paying attention. And we have the attention of so many young people, people who were feeling disengaged, people who thought this is just something they didn't want to pay attention to. That's one of the things I've been hearing from people is like they finally have something to be excited about. And the AKA sisterhood, how, how tight is that? And give us some background on why that's such a, I don't know, such a part of the story. Well, it's a huge part of the story. Of course, I'm here in my own capacity. So um, as a member of a sorority, especially part of the Divine Nine, we have what are all the Divine Nine, for those that don't know? Oh, the Divine Nine are all the um, African-American fraternities and sororities. Um, but the great thing about this is it tells the story of how they've been working behind the scenes for decades for service, getting people registered to vote, giving back to the community. And this is just really a culmination of what all that means to everyone who's involved in these fraternities and sororities. We are embedded into every corporation, into every level of government, into every school board, into every parental group. But now to see it come to the forefront of how mobilization matters as people in their own capacity, I have to say that. But as people who are part of these organizations can use all the things that the organizations have been about for centuries, I mean, not centuries, but for, for decades, yeah. you know. I have a particular pride in this organization as well. My great grandmother was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority in 1915. Wow. And when you think about what that meant for women to see an organization that they could be a part of, women were not as empowered as we are now. Right. But the organizations help empower women to empower their community, to empower their families, and that's what it all means to see this t top of the ticket on that on that level. Ah, Commissioner Donna Miller, we could talk to you much longer. We hope to talk to you as well at the convention. I think it's going to be a really uh, exciting time to see everyone there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So nearly 4,700 delegates will be at the DNC, but there's going to be a lot more watching outside the convention center, and everyone's going to be hearing from some celebrity star power, along with top Democrats, including former presidents. Here's a look at what you can expect during the convention. Although there will be kickoff parties this weekend, the DNC officially starts Monday. Opening the convention, Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson. Then later that evening, the DNC will highlight former presidential candidate and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, a tribute for Reverend Jesse Jackson, and President Joe Biden will deliver the keynote address, passing the torch after a roller coaster political ride this summer. The next night, we'll hear from Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker and former President Barack Obama. Do we participate in a politics of cynicism or do we participate in a politics of hope? It was the 2004 DNC when Obama was a little-known senator that his speech pushed him into the national spotlight. Illinois cast 59 votes. That is the same day we're expecting the delegates to conduct 
a ceremonial roll call to nominate Vice President Harris. The candidates are not expected at the United Center until Wednesday. With former President Jimmy Carter in hospice care, his grandson Jason is confirmed to speak one night on his behalf. Other big names include Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, a runner-up in the VP search. Wednesday night, former President Bill Clinton will take the stage, but the main attraction that night will be VP candidate Tim Walz. If his opening speeches are any sign, Walls will lean in on his Midwest roots, but also serve up sharp criticism for the GOP challengers. Then finally, Harris will speak Thursday. As is tradition for the nominee, her speech will be her chance with a huge national audience to reach out to independents and those who are still getting to know who she is. The DNC, it's four days from the 19th to the 22nd. That's Monday to Thursday. And though the general public isn't allowed in, you can still watch it because we're going to be streaming it gavel to gavel. And then you can also watch primetime on NBC5. Thank you so much for checking in.